thank you, Afton. Uh, can you all hear me as well? Uh, the mic is working. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to try and speed through some of our results that we present in this report. Uh, and my idea was to first start off with some introduction, but I think Kaisa has uh, already covered most of this. Uh, the whole thing started with this group of organizations from the different Nordic uh, countries represented in this study. Uh, and they basically came to us at SLU since we had previously been doing similar modeling work uh, beforehand. Uh, and they came to us with uh, basically starting off with this sentence that came out, out from previous work that they had been doing. Uh, it's to develop a new Nordic agricultural and food system uh, that would contribute to global sustainable food systems and climate mitigation, also taking into account the agroecological approach. Uh, and from this, what we did was we started off by organizing a number of workshops, both between ourselves within the steering group and uh, us at the university, uh, but also workshops where we invited, as today, stakeholders from this different areas of the, of the food system to discuss uh, these issues and uh, also present preliminary results from, from this uh, project we were doing. Uh, and from this process, we ended up with sort of a food vision. Uh, it was, uh, that I tried to bullet point out here, uh, it was to produce food within the Nordic region uh, for the population there. Uh, and end up with diets that would f fulfill the Nordic nutrition recommendations. Uh, we also wanted the, uh, the food system to be based on organic farming, uh, that is excluding uh, mineral fertilizers and uh, pesticides, and therefore relying on crop rotations to, uh, to manage the system. Uh, we also wanted to avoid the food feed competition between uh, livestock feed production and human edible food production. Uh, so that is uh, not uh, growing a lot of cereals to feed animals, but instead using, uh, for instance, grass legume lace included in organic crop rotations and pasture areas and uh, different food processing byproducts as animal feed. Uh, we also wanted to look at, uh, at scenarios where uh, agriculture is fossil free uh, through agriculture being uh, self-sufficient on energy. Uh, so therefore we also included uh, some uh, of the, the crops grown to be used to produce energy to, to feed the agricultural system. Uh, and that is, for instance, electricity or uh, machinery power and, uh, and also heating stables, for instance. So based on this food vision, uh, we employed a, a mass flow model of the food system that was uh, uh, developed based on previous work done by, for instance, my supervisor, Elin Dress, who some of you might be familiar with. Uh, and we tried to model this vision and look at how, how would this influence the, the diets, how would it influence the agricultural production and uh, also how would it influence uh, the environmental load of the food system. Uh, so we explored a lot of different scenarios in the, in the process, but we ended up with these two that are in the report. Uh, and it's basically two scenarios containing different number of animals. Uh, so as I said, we looked at an organic system, and therefore we assumed that we needed at least one third of grass legume lace in the crop rotations. So for instance, if you would have a six year rotation, we would include two years of, of, of grass in that rotation. Uh, and this is to partly to fix nitrogen, uh, since we, we don't apply uh, fossil uh, or uh, uh, artificially produced nitrogen, uh, and also to manage weeds in the, in, uh, in the organic crop rotations. Um, and the first um, scenario that I've used the blue color for, uh, we, we called sufficiency. Uh, and here we limited the number of ruminant animals to 
uh, just enough to be able to grass all these seminatural pastures uh, that we have in the Nordic region, which are areas where, uh, where we have a high uh, biodiversity that is conserved by grassing animals. Uh, so in this scenario, cattle and sheep were sort of limited to only gra to grass on these areas and, and be provided with some additional feed for the winter time. Uh, and the monogastric animals, that is pigs and poultry, and we also looked at uh, land-based aquaculture, uh, were limited to uh, different byproducts from the, uh, from the production of um, plant-based uh, food for human cons consumption. Uh, but what we saw in this first scenario is that we end up with a lot of these grass legume lace not being used. Uh, like we, we use some for winter feeding these animals grassing the pastures uh, and some to produce uh, bioenergy, but we still had a lot that we simply didn't harvest in this scenario. Uh, so therefore we looked at a second scenario, which we called efficiency. And here we simply tried to optimize the system to produce as much food out of the Nordic region as possible. Uh, so here we let the ruminants use this uh, excess grass uh, and also use uh, outfield areas uh, in Norway, which are, are pasture areas on the sort of the, in the more alpine regions and forest regions. Uh, and the monogastric animals used uh, still the byproducts, uh, but we also included some cereal grains grown for feeding purposes, uh, which I will explain a bit more about uh, in the next uh, slide after this one. Uh, so here I'm moving quickly on to the results. Uh, so as uh, uh, Kaisa mentioned, uh, we were happy to see that uh, it would actually be possible, despite lower yields following from organic agriculture, to feed uh, a large population uh, from Nordic resources. Uh, up to 37 million in this uh, in the efficiency scenario. Uh, but behind these figures, uh, and we can compare that to sort of the, the projection for 2030, which is 28 million in the in the Nordic region. Uh, but behind these figures, uh, there were differences between the uh, the, the individual countries. Uh, for instance, Sweden and Finland were sort of on on the border of being able to uh, self-sustain. Uh, uh, but, but Denmark, uh, due to partly higher yields, but also due to a much larger uh, area of arable land per capita in Denmark, uh, were able to supply for a much larger population than, than those living in Denmark. Uh, while Norway, due to uh, rough terrain and uh, uh, lesser area of arable land compared to the population, uh, were not able to... Uh, to self-sustain, but looking at the region as a whole, uh, uh, we saw we saw it, that it would be possible. So moving on, here I will sort of uh, force you to focus just on the right part here, uh, looking at the Nordic region in aggregate. So what we see here is basically the use of the the, the arable land uh, and the the leftmost uh, bar is uh, how we use arable land currently. And you can see we use it mostly to grow uh, grass or, or, or grass legume mixtures in, uh, and, and to produce cereals. Uh, and a very limited part of the arable land is actually, oops, ah, there should be some pointer, but I don't know. Uh, it's actually used to produce uh, uh, other crops for human consumption, such, such as uh, uh, oil crops and legumes and vegetables and roots. Uh, but in the scenarios we looked at, uh, we saw that the cropping system had to be much diversified, uh, going from grass and cereals uh, to a situation where we still include a lot of these grass legume lays uh, in organic crop rotations, but uh, uh, reduce the, the production of cereals since currently these uh, a large part of them goes to animal feeding. Uh, and to produce enough fat and protein in the diets uh, and uh, enough vegetables for a healthy diet, 
the the area of vegetables and roots and other crops had to increase quite drastically from uh, how we cultivate today, and also the area of rapeseed. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, the areas of rapeseed, uh, rapeseed is a bit of a problematic crop in, in organic systems since they are uh, affected by different diseases. And uh, uh, so, so there is a problem to, to grow these crops too frequently in the crop rotations. Uh, so therefore we had to, to limit this, the amount of rapeseed uh, that could go into the crop rotations. Uh, and this was actually found to be limiting the sort of the production system we looked at. It was not the production of protein, but it was rather the production of uh, plant-based fats that, would, uh, that was limiting our system. Uh, so that is why in the SY scenario, we actually cultivated more grass legume lace to sort of uh, space out the rapeseed cultivation there. Uh, but in the S uh, e efficiency scenario, we instead uh, allowed to e include some cereals grown for feeding purpose, uh, sort of instead of including the grass legume lace in the crop rotations. And the next thing I'm showing you is uh, a quite uh, messy thing, uh, but <laughs> there are uh, there is sort of a reason I'm showing it. Uh, it's because, like, it uh, it tells you something. It's this: the width of the uh, the the lines here represent the energy in that uh, uh, feeding resource and where it goes. Uh, so here we have these grass legume lays and the pastures and the byproducts, and we have some straw. Uh, and here we have the same plus the outfield areas. Uh, byproducts and then these uh, cereal grains that we included in crop rotations uh, in the efficiency scenario. Uh, but what I basically want you to see is that these grass legume lays represent the vast. Oh. Oops. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> represent the majority of uh, of energy available for feeding livestock, and for this reason. We can see that, and, and the livestock that are able to utilize these are basically ruminant livestock, that is cattle and sheep. Uh, so that is why a lot, of, a lot of the energy in feed goes towards cattle in our scenarios, and also some to sheep, uh, which leads to dairy and ruminant-based meats uh, making up the majority of the sort of energy from uh, from uh, animal sourced food in our scenarios. And looking at this uh, from sort of a different uh, angle, uh, we can compare the, the number of different livestock species we have in the Nordic region today or in 2014 here uh, to the number in our scenarios. Uh, and if we look at the uh, efficiency scenario here, we can see that. We actually have more sheep and goats and and uh, almost the same number of, of cattle as we currently have, uh, but the number of pigs uh, has reduced dramatically. Uh, but the uh, number of poultry is more similar, and this is basically because we try to optimize the system to reduce as much food as possible, uh, and poultry are much much more efficient users of the resources uh, than than pigs. Uh, how am I doing with time? I don't You've have a clock. been going for about 10 minutes now. 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, now we'll be looking a bit how how these scenarios would change the, the sort of agricultural systems. So now I'm moving on to how, how it would affect the, the, the diets that we consume. Uh, and what we found was, first of all, a quite sharp reduction in the amount of meat we consume. Uh, so, depending on the scenario, uh, we saw an 80 to 90 percent reduced meat consumption. Uh, but since uh, in the efficiency scenario we had a lot of uh, these grass resources going towards uh, dairy production, uh, we saw that in, in that scenario we had approximately equal consumption of milk and milk products as we currently consume in the region. Uh, 
And to compensate for this uh, gap in protein, energy, and fat from, from the, the reduction in animal sourced food, uh, we had to include more cereals, more uh, grain legumes, and more uh, plant based fats from rapeseed uh, in the diets. Uh, so that's what you see here that we that the consumption of cereals is increased and also uh, and also the the consumption of uh, plant based fats and legumes uh, and also since we we based our uh, scenarios on a, a baseline diet fulfilling the Nordic nutrition recommendation this diet was from the from the beginning already much higher in vegetables compared to how we consume uh, currently since we, we we should be including more vegetables in our consumption uh, for a healthy diet uh, and what I also really liked with this project is that we also included um, uh, a master student in nutrition in the project uh, and she was uh, after we, we presented her with uh, so this is how much cereals this is how much potatoes and how much meat we have in these scenario diets uh, and she cal calculated the uh, the nutritional values of these diets. Uh, and what we found was, uh, first of all, that these diets were high in carbohydrates, uh, uh, a bit too high compared to the Nordic nutrition recommendations. Uh, but if we would compare it to sort of the uh, World Health Organization recommendations, uh, these scenario diets would be within the recommended range. Uh, and I guess this depends on I guess the Nordic nutrition recommendations are based on how how we are used to consuming food in, in the Nordic region. Uh, we also found some vitamins and minerals to be challenging. Uh, most notably, we can uh, we saw that vitamin A uh, would be consumed in too small amounts, uh, and this is a vitamin that is mostly found in animal uh, animal source food. Uh, but it can also be found in in different plant-based uh, uh, types of foods, for, like carrots, for instance. So an option for vitamin A could be to uh, to select uh, uh, vitamin A-rich foods within within broader broader groups. Uh, we also saw that vitamin D would uh, would be deficit, and this is a vitamin. Uh, mainly found in oily fish, uh, but it's also fortified in many dairy products currently. So fortification, we didn't include it, we didn't include any fortification in our scenarios. So therefore, we also found deficits in, for instance, iodine, which is currently uh, fortified in salts, and that's why we meet that recommendation currently. Um, and um, we also saw deficits uh, in the consumption of iron. Uh, where an option could be to include more more whole grain cereals in, in the diets. Huh? Uh. Yeah, uh, we the, the, what we did with fish was uh, uh, we on the one hand we looked at the land-based agriculture uh, of a species called Nile tilapia, uh, which is a species able to uh, to live on plant-based sources, which our byproducts were. Uh, while the current uh, aquaculture in the Nordic region is quite reliant on uh, sourcing fish from the sea feeding to the aquaculture. Uh, so to avoid this, uh, uh, we, we didn't include uh, sea-based aquaculture. Uh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
Uh, and also, uh, now, now that the question came up, I'm also going to say something about uh, the wild-caught fish that we include in the scenarios. Uh, because here, we really we wanted to sort of have an estimate on the sort of what would be a sustainable fish catch for the Nordic region that could be fair in compared to other countries and sustainable uh, for the fish, fish stocks in the region. Uh, but we didn't have the expertise to do it and we, we, we didn't find anyone else who had previously done it. So what we ended up doing was looking at uh, projections for the, the total global fish cap, catch in 2030 and dividing that by the global population. Uh, so that was what we thought would be sort of a fair, uh, fair uh, amount of wild caught fish in in a diet. Uh, oh, now I have been accidentally going to the next slide. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we were talking about uh, changed diets, uh, and now I'm going to look more uh, specifically at uh, the meat consumption. Uh, so these uh, circles are uh, th their size is sort of I wanted to make an illustrative point here by making them uh, proportional to the, the amount of meat in the diets. Uh, so to the left we have the, the current diet, uh, almost 800 grams a week, and our two scenario diets with 1,850 grams of meat per week, including poultry. Uh, and what we can see here is that uh, the proportion of meat in diets uh, has shifted from uh, containing mostly poultry and and uh, and pork from monogastric animals uh, to containing more uh, beef and lamb that is ruminant animals that that can utilize these uh, grass resources and pastures uh, and especially we see that in the efficiency scenario where where the the meat from monogastric animals is a very small share uh, and from this. I'm moving on to the environmental impacts. Um, and as Kaiser mentioned, we saw large compared to how we consume food uh, currently. Uh, we looked at some different studies uh, of diets in the Nordic region, and they range between around 1.3 to 1.9 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per capita and year. Uh, and this is only emissions due to the agricultural production. So it's not emissions, including the processing and transport and uh, in home cooking, etc. of the food. So it's only the agricultural production. Uh, while the two scenarios we uh, investigated uh, led to emissions of 0.36 or 0.48 tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per diet and year. Uh, and the difference between them, we see that the efficiency scenario has a much uh, higher climate impact, and that is, of course, due to uh, much more ruminant animals in this scenario. Uh, but we saw sort of a trade-off between, okay, should we produce as much food as we can from the, the, the resources that we have, or should we try and optimize for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, because we can see quite clearly here, uh, on the per diet part here, we see that the uh, the climate impact is much higher in the efficiency scenario, but the land use per diet is, is lower. That means that we can feed more people. And I don't think there is an objective answer to this question. It's, uh, huh. <laughs> uh, uh, and yeah, I think that's what I'm saying here. Uh, so I'm moving on. Uh, and we also, looked at uh, 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 carbon uh, sequestration uh, in the scenarios. We only did it for the Swedish case, since this is where we had the, uh, the expertise within the university and they had models that had been doing this for, for the Swedish region. Uh, so we, did the, we, we calculated how, how much the net sequestration uh, would be compared to a business as usual scenario. Uh, where we would continue with the same number of animals and, uh, and the same uh, types of crops grown uh, uh, in Sweden, uh, and comparing this to uh, our two scenarios. And what we saw was that in the sufficiency scenario where we had 
we we had a lot of these cross leg inlays in the crop rotations, and a lot of them we left on the fields just as green manure. Uh, that means that we have a very high carbon input to the soils. Uh, and therefore, in this scenario, we saw a net sequestration where we were building the soil carbon. Uh, however, in the uh, efficiency scenario, where we removed more of this biomass uh, uh, through ruminant animals, uh, we, we saw a net, a net emissions from the soils. We were actually losing soil carbon. Uh, and this is a bit surprising. We were looking at an organic uh, farming system, and generally we would assume organic farming systems to sequester more carbon. Uh, but this is generally this is um, due to inorganic systems. We in, in, introduce more of these grass uh, uh, and legumes in crop rotations. Uh, but in the Nordic region, we we already have a lot of these. Uh, uh, types of crops grown. Uh, so therefore, the difference to the business as usual wasn't as large. Uh, and also in the model we used, uh, things such as uh, uh, increased allocation of root biomass uh, compared to above ground biomass in organic farming, uh, which is one uh, of the theories why organic would sequester more. Uh, is not included. So. Uh, but looking at the total figures, these uh, are quite small compared to the, the total emissions of our scenarios. So some summary or, or concluding remarks. We, we saw that we had a potential to feed a large population uh, from regional resources. Uh, and this despite lower yields of organic agriculture. Uh, and this was made possible by utilizing sort of the room in the food, food system that we would gain by, uh, by, by not growing, uh, growing food competing feed uh, to feed animals. And we saw a large reduction in meat consumption uh, and we saw a need to uh, have a much more diverse agricultural system. Uh, and we saw reduced climate impacts. And something I haven't been talking a lot about, we also looked at the nitrogen balance of the soil. Uh, and we saw in both scenarios, we saw deficits. That means that we were actually removing more nitrogen than we were adding to the soils. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this would not be, be, be sort of possible in the long run. Uh, so therefore, additional nitrogen sources would be needed. Uh, and this could partly come from uh, recycling human uh, excrements back to the soil, uh, but probably we would need to come up with uh, even more innovative solutions to, to be able to supply the soils with enough nitrogen. So that is what I had to say today. Thank you.